Okay, yeah, what is going on, guys? Welcome to the Wednesday night live stream. Today, I have Jason Mack on today. Now, Jason, you run Max Reef Dino Group, so you have been helping a ton of people ID, fight, and beat dinos in their reef tanks, which is pretty awesome, and it's really cool to see you doing that. I figured you'd be the perfect person to drag on tonight. We actually started chatting and forgot to hit go live, so go live number two. Um, so how are you doing tonight, Jason? <laughs> I'm doing fine. I'm, I'm great. Thanks. It's the Excellent. middle of the night here, but, uh, you know, I'm still awake. Yeah, I, I appreciate the 1 a.m. joining on, on your side of the pond, so much appreciated. No. Um, <laughs> perfect. Last one of the year. That That is true, actually. This is the last live stream of the year. So, so excellent. Nice. Yep. I know. So, the, the good fight with dinos um so one thing that we were chatting about is why we're seeing more dinos lately because i know back in the day you didn't really hear about it this year i feel like there's dinos popping up left and right uh phil in the comments reef keeper what group there is a link in the description to take you to his group so make sure to check that out later because a lot of the stuff we're pulling using resources will be linked in his group so what do you think the main the main reason that we're seeing dinos now in the last year or two versus like you know 10 years ago where you never heard of it i think it's uh, probably the advancement of uh, led lighting and the technology and the, the um the, the new foods the superfoods the super everything that comes out to feed the tanks for spot feeding tanks are running too clean everybody's trying to keep the nutrients so low and especially with new tanks for people who don't test enough on the tanks and, mm -hmm. and also coming out of a cycle with starting with dry rock and not having any nitrates or phosphates in, in your water. Yep. You're just going to open it up. This is uh, the, the, the environment that where dinos thrive. Mm -hmm. So mainly thrive with a lack of nutrients. Usually it, it could be an imbalance, but usually something's bottomed out. It's been zero. Um, fresh new rock, no bio load, anything on it. There's no nutrients for it to really work with in the first place. John Reefer Vermont, thank you for the super chat. Um, so we're going to have basically no, no nutrients. That's why most dinos start, or there's some crazy imbalance. Yeah, you, you can also get it when it's high nutrients. It's, it's an imbalance. Yeah. So well, I, usually it's zero nutrients. Mm -hmm. Now, do you think having like phosphates really high and nitrates low, for instance, like having the balance kind of teeter topped in the other direction where it could be an issue? Well, then you're going to see different things happening. If your uh, nitrates are low and your phosphates are high, you'll probably end up with a cyanobacteria. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, fair point. No, I have seen many tanks where they've had cyano and dino at the same time. Yeah, <laughs> and hair algae <laughs> as well. Yeah, I've, I've, I've probably seen them all. Mm -hmm. seen the, yeah. it's, it's the different, it's the state of the health of, of every tank is different. Mm -hmm. Nope. For sure. And with the first year of a tank, usually you're having a bit of a battle to get things stable and it takes a while for things to settle in. I find, you know, people have one issue and they throw some chemicals at it and it abolishes that, but then you might be killing off other bacteria and you're basically doing like a seesaw fighting until your tank stabilizes as it kind of matures. And that's why I kind of see it come up a lot more, at least in the first year or so of a tank. Yeah. So, now, one big question, when people are trying to battle dinos, dinos, whatever you want to call it, they, it helps to know what kind you have. And I know that's usually a hard part for a lot of people is IDing their dinos and knowing which one they actually have. Yeah. So ideally, you're going to want to have a microscope to be able to do it properly or have a friend with a microscope or some way to look at it. Um, I know I personally just ordered a fancier microscope to play with. I've, I was trying to ID stuff with this little guy, but it's only 200 times. It's not quite enough. So you ideally want about a 400 times in order to get close enough to see the cell structure and really get an idea of what it is. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay. So first thing to ID it. Um, now, three the three most common ones. You actually had a really good PDF I was looking at earlier. We kind of called out the three most common dinos that you see in most people's tanks. Um, do you see the other ones very often, or is it like 90% of the time it's those three? Uh, to tell you the truth, we see them all. Mm -hmm. 
we, we see them all and we nobody knows why one tank will get a specific type of dinos and another tank another specific type of dinos mm -hmm. this is one thing that baffles uh, everybody now what what's your theory on what brings out the dinos in the first place uh, the the theory at the moment that uh, for the dinos is that dinos are expelled zoanthalia from corals that have too much light or have been stressed, mm -hmm. and then they mutate to survive, mm -hmm. and they okay. turn into dinos. So coral. Uh, uh, we find this. I, I suppose you find it more with older tanks, with more mature tanks. Uh, there's, they think that there's certain trace elements that will inhibit the growth of uh, fast-growing algae, hair algae, or cyanobacteria, the pathogens, and for dinos. And it's, mm -hmm. it's things like iodine, zinc, uh, nickel. And when these things are out of balance, then dinos uh, can thrive, and zero nutrients is the trigger for it. There's dinos that are in every tank. They're part of the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And there's a and bazillion the, different types of them. I mean, it's in the corals. It's in, like, everything. Yeah. So It's in everything. Marine velvet is a type of dinos. Mm -hmm. Really? Hmm. Yeah. Good to know. Uh, okay, so reef mythology zoanthids. Do you really think phosphate nitrate that caused this and let it out of hand? Or the starvation of other bacteria that actually eat dinos and cyano? I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch your question. Um, they're basically asking if you think it's really the cause of phosphate and nitrate getting out of hand, or is it other back, or is it starving out other bacteria that would normally outcompete the dinos? I think it's. I think it depends on the on the state of the health of the tank, mm -hmm. as a, uh, opposed to a new tank, as opposed to an old tank or a more mature tank. Mm -hmm. And a new tank isn't likely to have the trace elements out of balance so much. So then it's probably going to be because of zero nutrients. And a more mature tank that might struggle with dinos and uh, getting rid of them and having them repeat again, coming back and going, then it's more likely to be probably an imbalance in trace elements, the halogens and the metals yep. that you need to correct. Okay. So it could be nutrients, it could be trace elements, but at the end of the day, something's out of whack, something's out of balance in your tank, and that's kind of yeah. gives a situation where it could potentially thrive. Yeah. Now, yeah. okay, now what, so the three most common ones, I'm going to butcher the names, but there is osteoporosis. Osteosis. Osteosis. Protocerturum. Protocerturum. Okay, and amphidinium. Amphidinidiums, yeah. Amphidididiums. Perfect. That's I, I like it. Uh, okay. Now, now the tricky part with some of these, um, a lot of dinos you can battle with UV. Some of them, right? Now, which one of the three is the nasty one that doesn't play nicely with UV? Uh, there's two. There's the Amphis and the Prorocentrum. Okay. Are they uh, the Coolia and Osteopsis? They migrate into the water at mm -hmm. night. That's why UV is effective on them. But Procentrum and Amphidibiums, they migrate into the sand and into the rocks. So yep. obviously UV is no good. Mm -hmm. No, that makes sense. And that's that's a little bit of a bugger. I know the ones that I personally had in the past, UV helped knock them back pretty quick. So that was the osteoporosis, I guess then. I mean, now, you, you can try and force them into the water column, but... Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult and it's always going to be a battle. And most times that... Nine times out of ten, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Or we find it doesn't work. The results aren't there for it. Yep. Uh, okay, so one method that I've read about recently is, like, raising up the temperature. Have you found that to work, to raise your temperature above 80 degrees? Uh, again, some people say it works for them. And but really, in my uh, experience of what we see on the groups, is for every one person who says it works, there's nine people who say it doesn't. Yep. And nobody can tell you on which type it works. We think it's probably going to be uh, osteopsis, which is uh, the easiest to deal with, mm -hmm. although it's the most ugly in the tank. <laughs> yeah, but easiest to deal with. And that's kind of like the snotty-looking one that tends to get little bubbles in it. And 
Yeah, all over, everywhere, on glass, corals, rock, sand. Glass too, eh? I haven't had it on glass. I've always just had it on corals, like mainly zoas and rock. Your wave pumps, your heaters, whatever, yeah. <laughs> now, is... With your... Are they are all dinos toxic, or is it just certain ones that are? Because I know certain ones can actually take out your cleanup crew if they eat it as well, right? Yeah, uh, the amphibians aren't uh, the least toxic, or, or almost no toxins. And mm -hmm. for them, we find that uh, yeah, some snails, grazers will will eat them. Yep. As long as as long as they actually get rid of it, and doesn't take them out. It's a good thing. <laughs> we've also, we've also um, seen under the microscope that uh, Tisby pods eating dinos. Nice. It's been actually, uh, you know, observed. Oh, very cool. Oh, I've seen your tank, so the lights have gone out on your tank now. Oh. <laughs> Curses. Um, okay, so dosing phytopods and pods can actually help because some of them will eat certain types of dinos. Yeah. Now, but if it's you... Also gonna, it's also going to support your microbiology of your tank. Mm -hmm. The phytoplankton is, is the, the, the start of the food chain. Yep. It feeds everything above it. And next mm -hmm. to the line is, is copepods and, and, and that sort of thing. So you now, want to get a good base of it in. Mm -hmm. Find diversity is the key in the tank. This is true. And it feeds everything. At least whenever I've dosed live phyto, I've just seen explosion in pods, everything else. It is their essential food source. And if they're helping eat your dinos or anything else, you're basically expanding your little army of dino munchers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Now, what would be kind of like your top tips, I guess, for someone fighting dinos? If if you don't have a microscope, say, and you don't know what kind it is, ideally you want to idea it so you know the best plan of action, but it's just like as a general scale, is there any type of methods that work against all of them or most of them? Uh, the advice we give is, uh, firstly, raise your nutrients if they're low. Mm -hmm. That's always going to be the first step, even before identifying dinos is correct your nutrients if they're low. Yep. Then you want to be running uh, activated carbon for the toxins. Mm -hmm. uh, you can reduce your lighting schedule, run uh, more blues and less whites, mm -hmm. and with peak time of five to six hours on a day. Um, yeah, dosing phytoplankton and copepods. pods. Ready okay. to try raising the temperature. Mm -hmm. So that's a good general basis if you don't have access to a microscope. Is just kind of yeah. start throwing the kitchen sink of methods at it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, perfect. Now, when, now, if you do know what they are, actually, I'm just going to pull up a couple little clips here, just just so you guys know. So the Austropsists. Um, so I pulled a couple clips that were kind of linked in there off of YouTube just to see if you get an idea visually of what they look like. Um, yeah, you, you probably won't see my screen share right now, but the Protocernum. Protocentrum. Protocentrum. And the one that starts with an A? <laughs> the ones that are spinning? That's uh, Osteopsis. Yeah, so Osteopsis, those guys actually, they spin around a little more. So another way to ID they're them. Almond shaped. The Oste Osteopsis are almond shaped. They have a point, like you can almost see like a white point on one end. And mm -hmm. they, spin, they spin around their axis, point inwards. That's why Osteopsis is the easiest to ID. You can oh, tell them just by the shape of them yep. and by the movement. So the movement is actually fairly important in IDing them. And this is something I didn't realize until recently, is if you're to see the shape of it, you don't know it moves. Like one thing that actually, I already forgot the name of it, what I thought was potentially dinos was whatever starts with the C. So I, I'm terrible at these names. But... It's because it wasn't really moving around, right? Where if you look at that guy and it's cruising around, spinning around that point is a whole different way to kind of ID it. So if you are looking at a microscope, pay attention to the way they move because that really helps you ID it further as well. Uh, yeah, so 40 times microscopes, kind of the sweet spot if you are picking up one. Um, that's enough to kind of see the cell structure and see it clearly um anything further is probably overkill anything less than that you're probably not quite getting enough resolution to properly id it well then you're going to be looking at the movement hopefully you can be able you should be able to see from the movement mm -hmm. which type which type it is yep obviously when it's the amphis or the prorocentrum then it's it's always they're the hardest to 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 uh to uh, id there you really need to be able to see the mouth or the beak 
to tell to be able to tell the difference. I'm actually kind of comparing them. They they are very similar looking. So the the Amphrodunium whatever one, it kind of looks like it has a little bit of a mouth or a head on it, where the other one's slightly more rounded. Yeah, the on the Amphis, the beak will either bend either left or right. Okay. And on, on the Prorocentrum, it's like a little dimple. It's equal on both sides with a little dimple in the middle. And the Prorocentrum, they have um, an, like it's like an extra cell buildup on the back. It looks like mm -hmm. a circle, like a ring on the back of them. Okay. Huh. Yeah, that makes sense. That's a good way of looking at it. You know your dino well. <laughs> <laughs> and then for Coolia, Coolia tend to be uh, almost, almost round, almost perfectly round. And they're mm -hmm. a little bit of a darker color. Okay. Now, if so, it's, if it's not a UV one, what would be your preferred method of fighting them? So UV doesn't work, right? They're the one of the ones that go into the rock or the sand. What would yeah. be your your approach to fighting them or beating them? Well, then we did uh, we did by uh, dosing sodium silicate solution, or uh, also known as water glass, and that's basically silicates, right? Yeah. And then by, uh, by dosing this, we're going to induce a diatom bloom. And the diatoms mm -hmm. are going to outcompete the, the dinos. Okay. So that, that's an interesting way of doing it. And that's another one that I just learned actually by reading through your guide today. So that's kind of cool. So you're using diatoms you're using to outcompete it. Yeah. And it, it's funny because I see so many people trying to like remove silicates. And now you're like, yeah, just dump them in. They'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not as easy as that. Yep. Now, so a lot of things in the tank will also eat those silicates, right? Like sponges and other stuff. So figuring out how much to dose is basically you're trying to force a bloom of it, right? Yeah. Now, basically, once... Basically, you can't crash your tank from overdosing silicates. The only problem, problem, the only thing that happens is your alkalinity will rise uh, slightly. So you have to keep up. We, we've never heard of a, a tank crashing from dosing silicates, and I've seen we've seen ICP test results with uh, as high as fifty-four parts per million on silicates on a tank, hmm. without any real ill effect either. Okay, perfect. That's good to know. And then, now, is it good to have a certain level after the fact of silicates in your tank, or would you want to remove them after, or does it not really make a difference? Um, the more you have after, then the longer it's going to take to to uh, remove them mm -hmm. that's why we always say when we when we advise the dosing for it we advise between two and three ppm and to, to hold it there mm -hmm. as long as possible and it can take sometimes it can take a couple of weeks on a tank and sometimes it can take months three two three four months of it dosing it yep yeah so it's it can be a battle for sure now Diatons were kind of cool because we were looking at photos of these earlier and they got like little pizza shapes of the different ones. And again, this is why it's good to have a microscope so you can kind of ID what the heck you're looking at. But yeah, yeah they comes in bazillions of different shapes and sizes. And um, the one that I just pulled up here are the most common ones. I like little pizza ones for some reason. They make me laugh. But you can see all the, all the different types. So you, I've seen people, you know, they think they have dinos and they just have diatoms, but being able to properly check out something under the microscope is going to go a long way. Well, diatoms and dinos uh, in a tank to, to the to the eye look the same. Mm -hmm. They both have, the, when it's a big uh, bloom, they can have strands and, and everything. And the colors are very similar. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to tell sometimes which is which. Yep. Now, it's, the same with the, it's the same with Christophytes. Mm -hmm. We were talking about this today. Yep. Yeah, Christophytes, thank you. That's what I was looking for earlier. Same thing, like that kind of looks like dinos, but under a microscope, it's not, you know, dancing around. It's basically pretty still, and that was the one main way to know the difference of the two. Yeah. Yeah, the shape of them and the color as well. Mm hmm And that advanced, yep, I will trust you on that one. <laughs> Excellent. Um, yeah, I've... <laughs> I've seen half YouTubers up with Sino Dino. I've seen a lot of posts about dinos lately for whatever reason. The last couple of months, there's just been tons and tons and tons of it. There's, it's over, it seems like 10 years ago, you never heard of dinos. Mm -hmm. Over the last five years, there's been a, an absolute explosion in it. Tons. I, I more think, and more. Yeah, I think our tanks are just too sterile now. They're too clean. 
it could, uh, you know, it could be, uh, there could be a link with the lighting, the LED lighting that we've, you know, we're forcing them out of the corals. The, the lights are too strong and, uh, hmm. you know, maybe we're trying to achieve too much, too much color for us. <laughs> maybe. Well, I know I there's mean, also... We, we can use power meters and we can set them all up. But, and corals tend to grow more in the blue spectrum. And the last over the last few years, all the tanks seem to be leaning more towards the blue colors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fair. M my kind of theory was around the whole sterile nature of it because everyone's starting with dry rock. Our, we have much better filtration compared to what we used to have. It creates that more, you know, pristine, sterile environment where if one strain of bacteria or something, it's easier for it to take control of it versus, you know, not dirtier, but a more diverse, not so sterile environment where there's more things to outcompete each other and kind of keep each other in check. That's that's my blind theory on it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, there's lots of theories on it. Yep. Uh, question from the chat, Kelly, do bare bottom tanks experience dino more often? And sand. Do you think the surface area of bacteria plays a role into it? Uh, again, it depends on the type of dinos because uh, the different types of dinos uh, reside in different parts of the tank. Mm -hmm. uh, Osteopathy are all over the tank, so they don't need a, a sand uh, thing. But yeah, we mm -hmm. do see tanks also bare bottom with dinos. Yep. See a lot of frag tanks as well, you know. Uh, That's that right. <laughs> Yep. No, no sand, just frag racks and a few fish. And yep, it's been yep. my pain in the butt lately dealing with it and getting it back in check. Um, inhabitants, bacteria, along with microorganisms. Yep, definitely. Uh, reading through the comments. Um, if you guys do you have any comments you want me to dig into, just tag me on it. Um, so Lex was asking about the whole temperature rise. I, I've heard mixed things on rising the temperature and the fact that may play into the type of dino it is, but... It, raising the temperature is certainly going to have an effect on the metabolical uh, workings of your tank. I think mm -hmm. your tank is going to metabolically work better at a higher temperature. Yep. Well, that's going to speed up the metabolism of everything in the tank, right? Yeah. Now, is it possible that it would speed up the metabolism of the dyno and it would make them expand more or be more of an issue? Uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't think I can... <laughs> Yeah. I don't think I can answer that one. That's fair. Okay. A um, couple of people are asking about ozone. Do you think ozone has an effect or helps with dinos? Uh, again, we don't really uh, see much or hear much about ozone uh, mm -hmm. with dinos. So it's, it's not something that we've explored. Mm -hmm. um, now... I think one of the problems is, is when tackling dinos is people try so many different things at the same time that it's mm -hmm. hard to say exactly which it was. This is true. This is very, very true. Um, and I'm, I've been, I'm guilty of that as well. I've just done a bazillion things at once until they're gone. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, so it is hard to say which one was the magic bullet or, you know, or was it just a combination of everything that helped get you there? This is why... The, this is why, for, uh, for the advice we give for Coolia and for Osteopsis, is a UV mm -hmm. because we know the UV works. Yeah, we've seen, we've cured hundreds, of thousands of tanks using the UV this way. Yeah, and um, the silicate as well for the for the um, for the amphibians and the Procentrum. Like, there's lots of products out there. You have Dino X, you have uh, Doctor Tim's Waste Away, all these, you know, and mm -hmm. most of the time it's nitrifying and denitrifying bacteria. Yep. Yeah, I believe Dino X is uh, like a, is a feed for Dinos where they 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 eat up so much that they can't eat anymore. Really? Yeah. Huh. And then the, then the, they expand. Like, oh, I can't remember what it was, but they almost die from too much food, so, you know? Gorge themselves to death. <laughs> yeah, basically, yeah. Crazy. I Dino X is very harsh, we find, on, on tanks and corals. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's very much a last resort, I think. Yeah, no, I, I, I would agree on that one. It does seem a fairly harsh one. Uh, in the past, I've done the whole waste away, and I've done that with the vodka dosing. I've done that method, which seemed to work, where you're basically using denitrifying bacteria or a different bacteria 
when you're feeding a carbon source like a vodka to basically up their little army of fighters that fight out competed that way. Your carbon dosing can also feed genomes. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> yeah. Amino acids can also feed genomes. Which one, sorry? Amino acids. Amino acids, yep. So best to cut back amino acids if you're fighting dinos or stop dosing it. Um, car- carbon dosing, again... You should never, once you start carbon dosing, you should never really stop. So mm-hmm. we would advise to reduce it, but not stop. Yep. So now... Maybe it'll have an impact on your, on your bacteria populations. Now, if you are carbon dosing, though... I'd say that's kind of the time when you'd want to do something like a waste away or something where it is a known bacteria dino fighter, right? Because then you're helping to up those numbers as well. The problem is if you've got no nutrients in your tank, there's mm-hmm. nothing to to uh, to uh, produce or there's nothing to work. They've got nothing to work for. Hmm. That's, that's true. So nutrients in check first. Make sure nothing's bottom out. Make sure you're in a reasonable balance. Now, uh, Cal- Callie was asking, how do you calculate how much UV wattage you need? Uh, we calculate it's one watt per three gallons or 12 liters. That's the recommended wattage. One watt per 12 gallons? No, one watt for th- per three gallons or 12 liters. Mm-hmm. I think it's okay. 11 point so, so, so field liters per gallon. Okay, excellent. So there you go good ratio for it bigger the better to be honest <laughs> if flow, you can a flow for through the uv is very important it needs to be as slow as possible almost mm-hmm. we recommend between like uh, what is it 65 100 uh, gallons per, 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 or three times your tank volume i think it is Th- three times yeah. your tank volume per hour yeah okay and this is important because it takes a lot. You have more contact time between the water and the UV. And the UV also needs to be temporarily set up, uh, pulling and returning water from your display. Mm-hmm. Your pump for your UV is hanging in your display. Yep. And it's, it's returning it into the display. Mm-hmm. Okay. So Rob was asking, so 120 would need about a 40 watt. Yeah, that sounds, yep. Yep, sounds about right. Um, and actually, that is the one that's on my water box now on my previous Lagoon tank. I had the same thing where I just had it running a little Tunesy pump, or not a Tunesy, a little CJ pump just sitting on the top of the tank, returning in the tank. And that actually did really well. Within a week, it was almost gone. Yeah, that's what we see. Normally, within seven days, uh, the Dinos, Osteopsis and Coolia, they're gone. Mm-hmm. Now, another thing you can do and use, which helps, is hydrogen peroxide, H2O2. Um, I find broadcast dosing that, I find that does help. With that, I've always went with the whole one mil per 10 gallons as kind of the rough ratio. How how has peroxide or H2O2 been in your experience against helping with dinos? Uh, it helps in many ways, actually. Mm-hmm. It helps uh, it's, It helps with control of algae, of uh, pathogens in your tank. It helps with gas exchange in the tank. And uh, like you say, it's one mil per 10 gallons. Yep. And uh, but you can go up to five times that amount without any ill effect on the tank, basically. Good and you know. can also use spot those problem areas like cyanobacteria. If you use a syringe, turn all your pumps, your weigh pumps off for ten mm-hmm. minutes, and spot those the areas. It'll take care of the cyanobacteria. Yep. Do small areas at a time. That works really well with hair algae and other types of algae as well. I've done that in the past. All your pumps off and just spot treat. Works really yeah. well. And it works a lot better with UV, hydrogen peroxide. Mm-hmm. Makes it two together. Do they have any, like, I mean, running the bolts, obviously, a benefit, but do they have any interaction with each other? Like, does the UV affect it, or just the fact that yeah, both of them helps? Uh, I think it's like, it strengthens it. Really? Nice. Hydrogen peroxide. I had uh, one of my buddies just pad peroxide on a doser every day. He's like, yep, love it. Tank's cleaner, never have algae. Has based his own little ORP kind of dosing in a way, which worked well. If you're dosing a lot of it, uh, I would advise dosing extra bacteria because obviously it, uh, it kills uh, indiscriminately, kills good bacteria as well as bad bacteria. Mm-hmm. Now, this is true. So 
any of these methods that, that you're doing that's broadcasting the whole tank, you are going to affect the good stuff and the bad stuff alike, right? So that's a very good point of dosing something like Mycobacter 7 or some kind of denitrifying bacteria to make sure you're keeping your good bacteria levels up. And when dosing something like uh, MB7, it's always, you know, always good to keep your nutrients in control because it, it will reduce nitrates as well. Mm -hmm. Nope, very, very true. So something you got to keep an eye on it. And it's a fine balance between your nutrients and uh... mm -hmm. now another thing that I thought was kind of interesting too was with more older established tanks are saying the imbalance of trace elements can actually result in dinos as well from you know either overdosing something like completely extremely high levels or same thing bottoming out on something can potentially do that that same imbalance can have an effect. Yeah, plus the amount of, uh, depending on the corals that you have in your tank, the amount of trace elements that are taken up by the corals as well is going to be a different rate. And it's so easy nowadays just to say, okay, yeah, trace elements, we're going to dose trace elements. Yeah, okay, everyone says dose uh, strontium, dose iodine. And to do it blindly without properly testing for it is going to lead to problems. Yeah, and hobby test kits really aren't very good at trace elements. That's something where you kind of, if you are going to dose it, you know, do those periodic ICB tests and make sure you're not way out of whack on any of your dosing and make sure you tweak it accordingly. Yeah. Do you dose trace elements in your tank? Sorry? Yeah. Do you dose them? Yeah? yeah. But I, 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 I do regular ICP tests and I dose according to the ICP tests. Okay. I just put them on a low dose on the doser. So I'm going to give it a month and send off an ICP test and see where it is and make sure nothing's crazy skewed. So hopefully. I've, just, I've, actually, I've actually just switched from uh, Triton other methods over to uh, Fauna Marin Balling Light. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm uh, still trying to uh, work it all out a little bit. Get her, get her tweaked back in? No. Eggs. Nice. Now, one thing that we did mention earlier, uh, we mentioned is making sure that you are running activated carb when you're doing this because some of the dinos are toxic. And yeah. They could impact, especially when you're taking them out, could impact your fish, your your cleanup crew, your inverts, that type of stuff. So running an activated carbon will help suck out some of those toxins and you'll know, make it a safer environment during the good battle for getting your tank back in balance. Yeah. Um, is there any other kind of overall good tips that you would do it? Um, I see some people say not to do a water change when you have dinos. Um, well, per the thinking behind the water changes is that they think that the iron... Uh, in the in the water is feeding the dinos. Mm -hmm. So if you if you can use a salt, if you're using a good salt that has a low iron content, then you probably won't see the same sort of dino uh, blooms as as what we're seeing. Okay, so iron that's the theory, eh? Yeah. Again, one of the trace elements. Good to know. If I was ever battling them, I would physically suck out, remove everything I could first, and then start battling them, just so you whatever treatment or method you're going with just to remove that initial hit or that yeah. or take them out. And if you were really at the water thing, you could run it through like a filter soccer or like a micron filter or something and then suck them out that way. That way you're not physically taking out the water, but you're physically removing that bacteria. Yeah. Yep. Good way to do it. So at the so, end of the day, it's all about the tank balance. To do that, to do that we would uh, recommend using um, um, a five or a 10 micron filter for it. Okay. Uh, the smallest uh, dinos is the small cell amphibians, and they're between 13 and 15 microns. And the largest dino is, uh, I think, about 85 microns. Okay. So your, your 100 microns and your 200 micron filter socks aren't, aren't really going to stop them. So or collect them. 10 or less, ideally, right? So, I mean, 5 microns is probably perfect. Yeah. yeah. There is, um, a while back, I did a video on one where I used uh, just like a canister filter and i put a little ch pump on it and hooked that up to my water change hose so it sucked everything through it and i use that just a clean sand bed and everything else without actually sucking out the water but that something like that with you know a five micron filter would be perfect for clearing all those dinos out i have um uh, an in tank uh, filter that i put mm -hmm. filter flop in yep. and then i go around and i, I blow everything off with a turkey base to get the get everything really dirty or blow all the rocks off all the corals all the go through the sand do mm -hmm. that a couple of times a day and do it for two days, two days a month, and then take it out. Yep. 
get rid of all those tiny particles. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Um, now, is there any other, can you think of any other general methods or remedies, I guess, or ways to kind of think that we haven't talked about that's important when dealing with dinos? Uh, well, the methods, uh, I don't know. <laughs> so we, we covered all the main ones. Everybody seems to have an opinion on how to beat dinos nowadays. And there's, there's so many videos and there's so much information out there. Mm -hmm. No, so true. Now, is there any resources that you recommend people check out or some that are better? Obviously, your Facebook group's um, a good one to check out, which is linked in the description. So um, I really like that PDF that you did on there. So yeah. there's yeah, a re do. really, really good guide you developed to kind of walk through ID and them um, and kind of methods about different ones, which I think was actually, you did an awesome job on that one. Well, this information is, is, is information that I've learned for over mm -hmm. the last three years of dealing with dinos and helping people mm -hmm. and seeing which, which results work best on, on tanks. Yep. No, that's, that's really cool. Um... I think there is one thing I, I would like to, to touch on while, mm -hmm. while we've got the opportunity. Yep. Uh, and that's with microscopes. And it comes to taking the sample. And so many people ask us, how do you take a sample for your microscope? For on the slide. How do you so, take it? Hmm. Yeah. How do you prepare it for you for your slide? Good question. <laughs> do you just take a piece of the algae? Do you, uh, you throw it on there? Do you take a bit of the, the sand from from the bottom and just throw that on there? So this is what we we recommend. You take a if you take a scoop, a little small container, take a scoop of the sand, if it's on the sand or if it's on the rocks, and you take a little piece of the algae, and then uh, then you mix it up. And mix it up really, really good till it all breaks apart. And then you take with your little pipette, you just take a couple of drops of that water and you put that on your slide. Mm -hmm. And then you then you uh, then it won't be as you know, as cluttered, and we should be able to get a better idea. You should be able to see more dinos or more individual dinos better than trying to look at a, a lump of algae that's you know got cyanobacteria in it and. Uh, Citalids and everything else uh, around it. So I take a little scoop on the slide and kind of like drag it across and let it like sparsely spread out. <laughs> yeah. No, just take a couple of drops. You just yep. a little couple of drops on, and uh, you don't need to, to suck up all of a big lump of sand and then put that on there. Yep. Because the thing is, as well, with the microscopes, with the when on the um, uh, the forty times. On the better microscopes, I should say, they're spring loaded. The lenses are spring little spring loaded on them, mm -hmm. and that the reason for that is is because when you're looking at the sample, the lens has to go so close to the slide that it's almost touching. Mm -hmm. And this is where people find it hard trying to dial it in and see and you know uh, get it in focus. And uh... now, do do you put a slide cover on your sample when you do it? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So a little tiny drop on there, slide cover on there, and just as normal. Yep. Now, this is probably completely unrelated, but I was looking online the other day because I just ordered a microscope. But so you can get slides that have a little tiny divot in it so you don't squish whatever you're putting on there for something a bit bigger, mm -hmm. which is kind of funky. A little concave bottom. Yeah. I don't, know, those are... for them, but I, I don't know what it is. Yeah, I just have the straight up flat ones. Um, excellent. So can you over UV a tank? Um, uh, no, I don't think so. Yeah. No. And the, the, the myth with this as well is you, you hear this as well. A lot of people would say, yeah, but a bigger UV and it's going to kill everything in your tank. But most of the good bacteria is not free floating. It's all in your rocks and it's in your sand. Yeah. There is a small percentage that is free floating and might go through the UV. But uh, mm -hmm. it's not going to affect your bacteria populations uh, at all. I, I always see people worrying about pods, but yeah, the same thing. They're not an issue. They're going to be mm -hmm. everywhere in your tank. They're in the surfaces. There's very few that just freely float around for a swim. Uh, if I go for 57 watt bib, okay. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I, I think the bigger is better. The, the only issue is like big UVs is some of them, but they're just like, 
like scr- massively long and they're just difficult to mount, right? I go with the, yeah. the biggest one that fits in your space, to be honest, if you are going the UV route. Um, a, lot only... people, a lot of people say as well that the bigger the UV, it's also going to bring more heat into your tank. Well, if you're somewhere where it's cold, it could be a good thing. Save you on the heating. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's cool here, and I'm sure it's cold there. Yeah, this time of year it is anyways, right? So it could be an advantage, depends where you live. You know, if you're living in Arizona, maybe it's not an advantage, but, you know, a lot of other places that aren't down south, you're probably fine. <laughs> so other foods for thought. Um, so peroxide dosing, that could be a good one. Uh, UV definitely helps. Fighting it with other good beneficial bacteria like Mycobacter or Waste Away, again, is going to help. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> John, you just saved me a redo of my view, UV. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome, and thank you, John. <laughs> uh, never had dinos down the road. Is it common? If you have an older established tank, you're probably fairly safe. But in newer tanks, I find I see a lot more, and more so the past year or so. <laughs> a big enough UV become a tank eater. There you go. Perfect. Uh, what about using a home system ver- versus an aquarium system for UV? Uh, the biggest thing, if a tank one, you need to make sure there's no metals inside of it. I've seen a lot of other ones where some will have like blades, scrapers, and different things in there, and that will mm-hmm. rust or leak over time. So just make sure there's no metal in it. Other than that, I mean, a UV bulb for sterilizing water or aquariums, the same thing, right? But it's what's inside of it. Make sure there's no metals. No stainless steel ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all plastic. Plastic and the crystal glass, and you're fine. Uh, do, 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 do. Perfect. I don't know. I know it's, I don't want to keep you too late because I know it's almost two in the morning for you over there. So I, I definitely appreciate the late night coming on. Got all, no got all spiffed up and everything. <laughs> there was a point. Of- yeah. Uh, this is an interesting question. Can dinos be transferred to another tank via a frag plug or a cleanup crew? Yes. Now, you could definitely introduce it. However, if your tank doesn't have some kind of weird balance, it's likely not going to take hold. And like, if your nitrate, if your tanks, everything else is happy, you're not likely going to cause a dyno outbreak from just it being on something. I mean, dip your corals, give it a rinse, anyways. You should be doing that. A healthy tank will keep uh, dinos in check. Yeah, it's the same. No. It's the same with with um, with it in a tank as well. A healthy mm-hmm. tank keep it in check. Yeah. And when you look at a sample from from your from your sound, you'll probably always find a uh, ick on a sample at somewhere at some point. Mm-hmm. Again, yep. they're in it's, every system. It's true. A- any surface they can put the little cysts on it could easily be transferred. So I mean, if your tank is everything's a balance, it's happy. Most things are on an issue, right? It's when something is out of whack, and one of those little pests will, can take over get yeah. the right conditions to thrive it's uh, the biggest cause is zero nutrients that's always going to be the first thing we ask when somebody comes on and says we've got dinos first thing we ask is what's your no3 and your po4 mm-hmm. um so what do you recommend most people keep their no3 and po4 at um okay i would recommend well, we recommend in a ratio of one to a hundred mm-hmm. so for every one no3 then you have 0.1 PO4. Okay. That's a good way to and for, for a mixed reef, then we would recommend between 5 and 10 ppm NO3 and 0.5, mm-hmm. 0.05 top to uh, 0.1. Okay. PO4. Perfect. So good, good happy you ranges. Is, obviously, you're going to be under them limits a little bit. Mm-hmm. So. With as long as you're in the happy ratio, right? Nothing's bottoming them out. Um, the other one I've seen too, where stuff has mm-hmm. popped up, where they've had like the the opposite teeter totter effect, where maybe they're they're really no nitrates, but have really high phosphates, right? It's just something that's completely out of balance. Um, yeah. I, I've seen that come up too a few times for other people talking about their dinos. Uh, Normally, we just advise people to dose them. I mean, there's so mm-hmm. there's there's so many different ways you can turn your skimmer off. You know, run your skimmer less, you can feed more, but it's very uncontrollable mm-hmm. and it takes time. So normally we just recommend dose either nitrates or phosphates and get them in the system, get them registering so that you can see them and that mm-hmm. they're there and then start dealing with the denos. Now, if someone is dosing a product, what have you used or what do you recommend they dose? Is there anything specific normally or just 
any aquarium branded nitrate phosphate. I think that, that I, that that's going to depend on, I guess, which continent you're on. Obviously, over Fair here enough. in Holland, <laughs> yeah, you know, we don't have the same products as you guys do, on the, on, mm -hmm. unless we're trying to import it. But it's, uh, you know, yeah, it makes uh, sense. Uh, yeah, the cost then is uh, not really effective. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Uh, Port Wolf was asking, will amphipods and isopods eat dino? And, uh, amphipods and no, it's, so it's, up to now, it's only the Tisby pods that we've seen eating dinos. Okay, oh, good to know. Uh, and one other one. Oh, this is so someone was I lost it, but they're asking about algae or calerpa. Do you think a refugium has plays into a big part of potential dinos or beating it or fighting it out? I mean, again, it depends on your nitrate and phosphate levels, but yeah. If it's stripping the if it's stripping the water for your for your for your nutrients too quickly, then you're gonna open yourself up. Mm, so reduce your lighting on your refugium. Easy way take to take them out. Pull yeah, out remove some, take some out, put less in. Yep. Uh Petimal Life Super Chat, thank you very much. Have a fantastic twenty twenty one. Definitely will. <laughs> All right, I think we covered most of it. Um, I feel bad because I know it's like 2 a.m. for you. <laughs> yeah. um, so definitely check out your Facebook group. Uh, the link is in the description. And that PDF you did, you did an excellent job on that. So it's a really good guide. So I might even link that one. But just check out the link in the Facebook group. It's easier to find. Yeah, it's an announcement. Perfect. Beautiful. All right, sir. I appreciate it. I'm going to let you go to bed. But I really appreciate you coming on today. Thank you, Jason. No problem. It's been uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, and uh, you know, we wish everybody a happy and a healthy and a safe twenty twenty one. Hopefully, COVID free and uh, Dino free. Yeah, Dino free, thriving reef tanks. Um, yeah. Definitely last live stream of the year. So happy New Year to everybody, and yeah, enjoy those reef tanks. If you enjoyed it, as always, hit the like button. Check out the links in the description below, and I'll.